All right, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, we've had a lot of questions from a bunch of you about the stock market and about what's going on with the stock market. So um, I don't know how many of you knew, but in a previous life, <laughs> I used to work for business channels and uh, I used to track investments, mostly for retail investors. Um, I did a lot of work with mutual funds and insurance and that sort of thing, which I will tell you from personal experience, um, helped me through some rough times when I was unemployed in between jobs because I had put money aside in mutual funds, helped me buy my house, which is the money that I used, uh, which was put aside in mutual funds as SIPs from the time I was 24 years old. So I strongly believe in using mutual funds to put money aside for retail investors like you and me. And the advice that I used over the last 15 years uh, is Dhirendra Kumar of Value Research, who has been kind enough to give us his time this evening and help us understand what's going on with the stock market. So you guys are really lucky that we have Mr. Kumar join us right now. Good evening, Dhirendra Kumar. This good, is a pleasure for me, particularly because uh, we're talking after a really long time, but it, it feels like no time has passed at all. Uh, I want to yeah. thank you for all the amazing advice you've given us all. But what has business been like? What's happening in value research right now? Uh, value research is quite, you know, life at value research is quite eventful because I'm still excited to go, you know, get to office every day. Uh, though nowadays, you know, the, my home actually, you know, for a full year, it became the workplace. Uh, but, you know, exciting times because I find that, you know, uh, I've been running value research for nearly 30 years. Looks like, you know, 20, 25 years, the first 20, 25 years was uh, just incubating it, creating awareness, help, you know, a lot of people just wanting to know what is a mutual fund? Is Does it really work? Can you realize it every day? So, you know, our last four or five years, I'm witnessing that uh, the mainstreaming of mutual fund, which is very satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, mutual fund is one area where I actually derive great satisfaction from another fact that uh, when I look at the segments of financial markets, you know, whether it be insurance, endowment plan, ULIPs, uh, PMS and all kinds of things, you know, fixed deposits, you know, what any individual investor does. I think, you know, the number of happy stories, the number of success stories, the number of people who have actually been able to do something meaningful out of their savings here, being able to, you know, participate in the market in a methodical way, managing their risk, riding through the ups and downs, that I think is very satisfying. And, you know, I come across a uh, lot of a lot of letters acknowledging that you know they uh, uh, I have not been a tipster I have not been get, get making recommendations. Of course, in investor guide we we used to run four or five portfolios, and I still get requests to keep them live. You know, keep doing it. Uh, but uh, what I find is that you know creating awareness, making people understand how things work and how to how to use it, how to benefit from it, and bring in the discipline of investment. I think uh, it's very satisfying. And I think it's still early days going by, you know, when I see the surrounding, uh, people are still looking at it as a one-off event, still way off from becoming mainstream, but yes, well on its way. Absolutely. So, you know, we've had so much go on with the markets, especially over the last five, six days. We're seeing deep cuts in our markets, um, picking up cues from what's happening in the global markets as well. Now, for our audience sake, this is what we've been told. There are a couple of things happening in the world right now. The US Federal Reserve, which is their RBI, is looking at their interest rates. Uh, it's a likelihood that they will increase interest rates. And when that happens, a lot of the foreign investors who have invested in our stock market will take the money back and move it back to the US. And we'll talk about what that means. The other thing that's happening is there's tension between Russia and Ukraine and the US and the UK have said that yes, there's a possibility that Russia might invade Ukraine, and that is never good for anybody's market. Right? So that's causing some nervousness as well, we understand. And crude oil prices are at a shocking high. Now, we've not felt it in India because elections are on, right? which is normally when elections are on, they don't pass on that. But you can rest assured that when these elections, when the voting is over by early next month, um, uh, or by mid next month, it is likely that we will start to see higher petrol prices as well. But these three things have caused global markets to sort of take a beating. And as a result, India has been taking a beating. The questions that a lot of people are asking are right now are, you know, what does this mean for Indian investors? And before I go to that, I just want to ask you, 
um, Mr. Kumar, if the Fed increases interest rates in the US, my understanding is that it will be over the course of one year, a total of 1% increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that in India, on an average, debt investment still gives 5 6%. So why will these foreign investors take their money out of India and take it back to the US at 1%? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 1% looks very nominal, will look very small. But, you know, if your interest rate was zero or if your interest rate was one, 1%, and if it actually becomes 2%, it is 100% rise. Or, yeah. So from, from that standpoint. You know, uh, you remember when we used to run, uh, when we used to do uh, investors' guides, interest rate coming down from 9% to 8% looked like, you know, uh, a very small change, but it looked, uh, but actually it was more than 10% decline in the income of a person who was dependent on interest from that uh, deposit yeah. that he has made. So that is quite meaningful while the inflation goes up and your, your and th that is one aspect. The, you know, why people actually pull out money from equities simply because uh, uh, interest rates are also a reference point for your risk-free return. You take no risk and that is the return that you get. So if you are getting some, some return on your, uh, the risk-free return was something. And now that risk-free return has actually gone up. So you will actually pull out money from where you are actually taking risk because equity is considered as a risk investment. And in, from that standpoint, we see this global turmoil, but at the same time, well, we have to really take a note that, you know, how relevant or how enduring the impact will be. Is it going to be a temporary thing? Is it going to be a permanent thing? Or is, can it translate into a very a massive blow to the Indian market? Uh, it is entirely a matter of, you know, the relative relevance or, you know, dependence of that on that market. When uh, such a thing, when the global financial crisis happened in 2008, uh, when we were just beginning, that was the time, you know, when uh, investors, you know, foreign investors pulled out. And when the investors pulled out of, you know, a little higher scale than today, our markets actually crumbled. It, our market on the Sensex went down by nearly, you know, about 55%. Imagine, you know, from 20,000 peak to uh, 8,500, uh, that was a low point. So that was quite meaningful. Uh, today, the complexion of the market has undergone a change. Domestic mm. investors have become far more, you know, they are more than, you know, are able to counterbalance the impact of uh, foreign, uh, foreign investors' outflow. And variety of reasons, you know, now the individual investors collectively through SIP invest nearly 10,000 or little over 10,000 crore every month. The other thing is that, you know, uh, Employee Provident Fund organization, it actually is supposed by its mandate now supposed to put in 5% of its incremental flows into equity market through the index fund. So that is why you see that, you know, the uh, ETF of SBI Mutual has become the largest fund in next to no time. It has actually become the largest Indian fund in the shortest possible period. Uh, more than one lakh crore, you know, it is, it is a large number. Uh, then national pension system that has also that is also becoming meaningful and now people have the choice and now it's a it's become a choice it's, you know discretionary uh, saving for employer savings vehicle long term savings vehicles for employers so that that money is also becoming very relevant so all of this put together uh, and that apart domestic investors there is huge appetite even now because the interest rates in India has come down to such a low that even here. We are finding a reverse of what is happening in the U.S. There, the risk-free return is actually going up. Here, the risk-free return is coming down. And when the risk-free return is coming down, people are willing to take risk. And uh, they think that, you know, we anyway don't earn anything meaningful by putting uh, making our deposit or making our post office deposit or the monthly income plan and things like that. So might as well invest in SIP, invest in equity through this. So that apart I Forgive me for interrupting you. Just to yeah. just to put this into a nutshell, what you've said so far, you said that yes, there is right now movement happening in overseas markets, but it's not permanent. It's not going to, you know, it's a temporary thing. In the meantime, we are not as dependent on foreign investors as we used to be, maybe yes. three, four, five years ago, because over the last three years, our domestic investors, our retail investors, doing SIPs, yeah. 
the uh, PF money through the EPFO, our mm, NPS yes. money is all going into the stock market and that has created a base which yes. gives us more stability. And quite a stable base in a sense that, you know, always in the past there has been, you know, some kind of uh, uh, seasonality, you know, it, it has been a very seasonal thing that people get excited about equity that then they will walk out uh, in a half. Uh, no longer, that is not the case right now. In fact, every time there is a decline in the market of uh, a steep decline, I find that investors actually pour more money. Uh, yeah. It's quite a contrarian behavior. Uh, that is one. Then the Which is incidentally what market. we saw happen this evening as well. After five days yeah. of cuts towards the end of trade today, we saw retail investors come in and buy again on the dip. So there is a stronger bottom because of the Indian retail investor. Yeah, I think even sharper example, you know, bigger example was March 2020, when yes. even before, you know, everybody thought that, you know, world is coming to an end. And uh, rightly so, because nobody knew anything at the stage, you know, March 2020, the last week, that was yes. the time when actually the world was coming to a standstill. And it was happening in front of our eyes. Nobody and... Uh, when you have a global lockdown, forget about, you know, it was nothing localized. It was not a <coughs> India-Pakistan war or something in yes. a specific territory. You know, it was anywhere you see, there was, you know, uh, unimaginable uh, surrounding. So that was very scary. Still, the market was able to make a, such a steep comeback, you know, a steep fall in a, uh, in a week's time. And then, you know, <laughs> going down by 30% and uh, making a comeback mm -hmm. and never to slide again. Uh, in, in fact, forgive me lockdown. again. I just, I'm just going to ask Ira, who's my producer, who's looking at this chart right now, to take us to the five-year chart of the Sensex, Ira. Um, or you know, yes, there you have it. Yeah. So that yeah. sharp dip is what uh, uh, Mr. Kumar is talking about. You can see that there. That is when the whole world shut down because of COVID. And look at what we've done after that. That's the pandemic year that we're looking at from that dip yes. to where we are today, where the last five days actually doesn't even register if you look at it from that point of view. Yeah, this is actually the long-term view. And in fact, if you look at it from, you know, even the pre-pandemic level of 40,000, uh, we have scaled close to 60,000 on the Sensex, which is, you know, 50% uh, gain from there on. Uh, so mm -hmm. don't look at it in terms of, you know, number of points. You One should look at it in terms of percentage. Because, you know, 1,000 points when the market was at 3,000 points is a, was a different thing. Uh, 20,000 points on 40,000 level is a completely different thing. Uh, it's still less, yeah. uh, though it might look like 20,000. So uh, just uh, uh, getting a perspective there. So, you know, that is, that is the real story. That apart, uh, you know, the relative position of India globally uh, in terms of all the possible markets, is still attractive. You know, we are the only economy about which the, it is expected that we will witness the, we have seen the fastest recovery and we have seen a double digit growth. We, we still talk of growth, you know, people. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there is a great deal of promise. Also, you know, a lot of things that has happened in the past, you know, in past two, three years, uh, if I just list, you know, a couple of things, you know, for the first time we saw that the corporate tax rate coming down to 25% and people have yes. forgotten. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, the implementation of GST, which is hugely uh, beneficial for businesses to get organized, get, get, get better organized and uh, have, you know, this is actually shifting of unorganized business to organized. So big mm -hmm. businesses, the publicly listed universe will benefit. Uh, of, after all these years of, you know, fumbling, the government is finally taking real steps to uh, with disinvestment. You know, Air India has been sold. The, so, you know, it's a huge thing because taxpayers' money used to fund all the inefficient companies and the government was unable to manage it in a manner that, you know, I don't think that these businesses are inherently inefficient. Just that the configuration of a government-owned company is such that they were unable to give, bring in the efficiency to be, a, you know, uh, an efficient business, a profitable shareholder-focused business. Uh, so those things are changing. And, you know, the next, the, what is in the pipeline? But that apart, I think there is another thing that has happened, which is very significant. Democratization of the market. You know, mm -hmm. today, if you have an Aadhaar card and if you have an online bank account, you could be up and running and investing in the market in 15 minutes flat. Uh, you have the Zeroda and the Grow and the Paytm money and the ET money and whatnot, and, you know, through which. And then the, you can invest in mutual fund, the direct plans, the, you can be investing in the, uh, in the equity market directly. 
So now it is entirely a matter of your own imagination, your your ability to put in, uh, you know, hours, time, and effort in learning where to invest, uh, how to invest, and uh, you know, uh, is is entirely democratized. And it is, you know, anybody who has a smartphone is an eligible investor. Well, you did talk about all of the good things that are happening that have boosted our market, but there's also been chatter about the fact that the last two years, and we saw that really sharp increase. Um, was not actually running with the fundamentals of our economy. We had severe unemployment. Uh, we still have reports coming out on a daily basis now saying that the bottom 20% of our population has lost 50% of its income. Uh, poor have become poorer, and so their ability to buy is, um, you know, is, is, is suffering. Farmers are in distress still. Uh, do you believe that any of that will affect our market at some point, or... Um, are we, you know, are these two things K-shaped and completely not related to each other? No, they are related. In fact, uh, that will all translate. You know, if we have large number of poor people, then the taxpayers have to take care of them, and that is what the direct benefit transfer will take care. Mm-hmm. You know, that is what. And and but at the same time, I feel that you know the organized business. When you look at, uh, you know, last two years, the pandemic, the beginning of pandemic, and so far. In fact, it is quite surprising that, you know, corporate results are so resilient, despite, you know, uh, and uh, things, uh, you know, the service economy has also been able to reconcile with it, has been able to, you know, live with it and grow as well. Uh, so in that sense, yes, that, that is a bright spot. The worst, the bad part is that the poorest of the poor people, you know, I, I really, uh, I agree with you. That when I see the Thilawala or the guy who was actually making the omelet on the roadside, uh, he's really in distress. And many of them have gone back forever. And uh, many people, you know, I, and I think there is also a bright side to it. Uh, the, rever- the, the reverse of the urbanization, the people who came here and actually were living a very difficult life, they have gone back uh, home. And uh, with the essential support and little bit of vocation, I think they are leading a much better life, some of them. Uh, uh, so in that sense, you know, people who are little skilled, but they were living, a, you know, their cost of living in a city was very high. And uh, getting back home, even earning half as much, if they are actually leading a much better life. So, uh, that, but, but I don't think that's a bright spot. This is actually a more, produ- <clears throat> uh, this is a disruption of an unusual kind. And, uh, uh, Given the constraints, I think, you know, whatever has been done or, you know, uh, much more could have been done, but I don't know <clears throat> how to deal with it. I'm not an expert on uh, the public policy and things like that, that how it could have been optimized or maximized or, you know, how one could have been more uh, serviceable. But, you know, yes, technology has played a role with the direct benefit transfer or whatever the, uh, you know, food uh, d- dissemination mechanism government. Yeah. Do you, Mr. Kumar, see this uh, volatility in our stock market that we're seeing right now? And we do, like the three, four problems that I called out globally are not going away by Tuesday. They're going to take time. It's likely to spread out over the next one year at least. So are we going to see this kind of choppiness in our market continue for the next few months? What is your expectation? Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, it is very important to dissect the kind of decline that we are witnessing. If you look at, you know, the main, you know, the top, uh, what you, uh, what we are actually talking about, the fall in Sensex and Nifty, that is what is being talked about on the television. That is the broad uh, barometer of the market. But I think the fall or the cut is far deeper. If you look at the, the breadth of it, uh, and if you look at the popular, popular category, you know, if you look at the new age companies, which went public mm-hmm. in recent times, they are down 50% from their high. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, so that is not something which, you know, people will take kindly. That will scare a lot of in, first-time investors forever. And rightly so. Uh, you know, the, the, the many investors, come, you know, some, simply they come into the market, they participate in a party, and uh, they don't apply much of my, uh, you know, thinking where the buy are they investing. And, you know, understandably so. Because uh, what has happened in the last six months, one year, is that you just come into the market, invest in something, and everything goes up. And uh, one has to see that, you know, when the music stopped. And that is where, you know, a couple of days back, the music stopped. And uh, then some of these, I would, uh, you know, I have a series of suggestions for many of these people. 
Uh, one is that the people who just came into the market accidentally and they thought that, okay, it's easy money being made. Uh, they should think harder about it. It is not easy money. This is very much a part of it. This is the nature of the beast. Market is always like that. It happened in 2008. It went down by 55%. Small cap index went down by 70%. Smaller companies have fallen so much more and it may not be noticeable or you, know, you may not register it now. Uh, look at your investment. And uh, it is also important that, you know, uh, bigger, you know, big mistakes are committed when the market is, uh, is in, on an upswing, yeah. which it was till about a year ago, uh, till about a week ago. And uh, as markets get, you know, uh, fall, and this fall is not going to be forever. Uh, it's, take your lessons, formulate your strategy. If you can't do any of these things, decide how much can you save every month, start your SIP. Start your SIP in a multi-cap fund. These are the funds, you know, because what happens is, you know, uh, people get greedy at the wrong time and it gets very easy to be greedy because, you know, so, so much money, so quickly the market goes up and uh, you don't have a much of a reason to think that why or what is going up, how to be careful. Uh, but now the blow that has come, come about, I think it's a very desirable thing. People should take note of it. And it happens every couple of years. Uh, uh, I think the real worrisome thing is that the new animal which has hit a lot of youngsters, which is the crypto, that is something, you know, uh, which is on a free fall. And, the, you know, there is something where you, you don't have much to study. The only thing that was going with crypto was that it was going up. So everybody had to board the bus because you're missing the bus. And now everybody has to climb down because it's on a free fall. And uh, the free fall is, is of a kind, and there is no other character to it. Uh, more people selling, so it goes down, more people buying. And it's also about time to, you know, think sanely about what it is. Right. Uh, it so, is being so referred as a, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's actually break this down and take it piece by piece. Uh, and I want to start with the first thing you did say, of course, smaller companies will take a larger beating. Now, whether I'm going into the stock market right now to buy stocks directly or I'm going in via mutual funds, would you say this is a good time to avoid a small cap or a mid cap sort of punt because that is where the real beating has happened over the last five days? Yes, uh, it is very important for in, you know any new investor, any investor who has come in the market in the last two, three years should not start with a small cap or a mid cap because uh, uh, good times, they gallop. But you know uh, when they fall, they, they crumble. And that is something which has the potential to scare you out of the market forever. And uh, that is a huge opportunity loss because being driven out of the market, which is such a beneficial thing for anybody to build long-term wealth, that uh, this kind of intermittent shakeup uh, will scare you so much. And it just requires experience. You know, unless you have been through a full market cycle, it is very difficult to withstand the decline because still yesterday, you know, somebody was witnessing that, okay, he has accumulated, you know, something like 10 lakh rupees. <clears throat> and in two weeks time, you find that, okay, it is no longer 10 lakh, it is 8 lakh. And, you know, then you start comparing it with the decline of 2 lakh, how much time it takes for you to earn. And uh, the reverse was happening. Everybody was trying to board something or the other because everybody had the sense that they were missing out on our opportunity. So the reversal of this, not too many people will not be able to reconcile. And the newer the investor, more vulnerable he will be. Because, you know, if somebody is losing his gains, you have a different attitude. If you are losing your capital, it's a completely different story. So your 10 rupee becoming nine is, you know, uh, very painful. Your 11 rupee, or, you know, if you invested 10, it became 11 and you lose one rupee gain. It is not as that much, uh, as that, that painful. So, you know, uh, you have to really prepare yourself now, take lessons from this and uh, work on a strategy, a long-term strategy. And it should be a saving strategy. Uh, it should be an investment strategy and it should not be, you, you, because most, uh, most of the time people have this impression that, you know, some expert knows it. You need to find the, get the trick. And uh, uh, the, if you can perfectly time it, you can be wealthy. Uh, no, a lot of people, a lot of common people can be wealthy by just being methodical. In fact, being methodical, being disciplined, starting your investment now creates a greater potential of you being well, well off or being wealthy than, you know, uh, trying to time it yeah. and, you know, try, trying to do some gymnastics around the market. Um, 
you know, in fact, we have some of those questions that's come in. So that's a good answer for you. Someone who asked us, can you become a millionaire by just investing in the stock market? This was Robin John. I think the answer is if you're method, uh, methodologically, your approach, you do proper research, uh, you use an SIP, you don't attempt to sort of time the market, jumping in, jumping out, then you should be okay. Uh, the other thing I did want to ask you about is... Um, these new age companies, which you did mention a little bit, the ones that did their big IPOs over the last six mm-hmm. months are startups, um, you know, companies like Paytm, for example, um, you know, uh, 197 Communication, let's take it a mass car trade. There's a bunch of these companies. Mm-hmm. There are questions now popping saying, okay, have they found their bottom? Is this a good time to sort of buy them up at this point? What is your advice or your response to that? My advice to investor is that, you know, uh, there are some ground rules which you have to follow when investing in stocks directly. These are companies, you know, just because they are startups and, you know, somebody has invested money, they have been so much of them. And, you know, a lot of people, these are consumer businesses as well. People are very familiar with, you know, Zomato. People are very familiar with uh, Paytm. Uh, but, you know, investing in a company uh, is basically you are becoming an owner. Uh, everybody was actually investing in the ticker. Everybody was looking at, you know, stock. It is not stock. You are becoming the owner of a company, however small. And then you are, and when you become an owner of a company, you have to see that this company will grow. It will make money. And it will be able to provide you decent return on investment. Uh, when it comes to growth, these companies are growing. When it comes to making money, they are not. And so the return on investment is still, uh, you know, some time away. And uh, how long away? Because, you know, many people are just getting uh, get excited about the big numbers. Somebody got a billion dollar worth of funding. Yeah, that fellow, you know, invested a billion and he actually made two billion. How does it matter? You know, you are going to buy that stock for two billion. And he then that is how they have made their money. So you have to see that how if you invest at these valuations, how much money you will make. I don't know, because, you know, nobody is giving you a plan that how how much money they uh, when they will be, first when they will make money when they will become profitable and what that profitability will be how much and will it be a sustainable one will it have some kind of will they have some kind of competitive advantage but compare that with you know any of the old businesses you know maybe some businesses uh, bigger businesses older businesses may not be growing that rapidly but how uh, growth for the sake of growth is not a mere, very wise thing for a shareholder you have to think like an owner. You have to think like a shareholder. Mm-hmm. And start thinking like that. Start reading up. And if you can't do any of those, at least buy a fund so that you are able to spread your risk around you know, a bunch of stocks. And your financial future is not linked to the success or failure of these companies. Also, one should look at you know, the kind of glamour around these uh, companies. Uh, you don't invest money to... Uh, to, for, for, to look fanciful or, you know, something uh, you should not be fancy uh, this thing. Uh, you invest so that you can generate enough return on your investment. And if you don't have those variables nicely in place, it is very difficult to even do any kind of estimation. Uh, yes, at some point in future, it will happen. But are you the right person for that? I think uh, I would urge investors that somebody who just drifted into the market and invested in these IPOs, they should look, take a very hard look at these uh, and uh, take lessons. And so, and take lessons. You know, the advantage is that you know, uh, uh, in, in taking lesson is very important because uh, there is no way you can learn about all this by by being uh, by listening to stories. You have to experience it. You have to experience the loss. You have to, and the earlier you do it, the better it is. Uh, I did it in the early 90s. I did all this nonsense and actually lost everything what I saved in the initial one or two years. And, so yes, uh, yes, here's the question. My audience tends to be very young. A lot of them are on Instagram. They're asking, what should we do now? Are you saying that this is a time to go out and make mistakes with cryptocurrency, with the Paytm stock, with, uh, you know, with startups and things like that? Or are you going to say, pick a multi-cap equity diversified fund, put money in an SIP, sort of take it one step at a time. I'm just, before I come, no. before I come to you to answer that question, I, this, is the, this is the PTM stock that we're looking at. I'll ask Ira to show us five days, which is the cut we've seen over the last five days. There it is. And if you show us the last one month, Ira, 
um, as it well. It was the maximum since lifting. So, you know. Yeah, just, just go max. Yeah. yeah, from the time it was listed. There it is. That's a severe loss of value for those investors. Yeah. You know, it has come down to 914 and the all-time high was close to 1800. So, it is 50% decline from the peak. And uh, uh, quite a significant loss from the allotment price. And, you know, lot, not everybody got allotment. Uh, so you will have a lot of lost opportunity because you block a certain amount of money. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would say that it, it is all fine. You don't have to really curse yourself or you don't have to really get out of it in a half. Uh, take it as it is. You know, I think there is a price of learning and this is what you are incurring. Uh, earlier you do it, better it is because you do it on a small scale. If you don't take the lessons and if you remain lucky for 10 years and then the, it becomes very sizable, then you'll lose, your, lose the fortune. So losing a fortune as compared to you know, losing in your early stages is far better You if you are actually playing around with your pocket money or your initial income, which is because the income <coughs> compound, like, likewise in investments compound. And uh, so earlier you learn it, better it is. I think I would like to give every, every youngster a framework of how to participate in all this. By all means, you should do it. Uh, but by all means, you should do it with you know 10% of your money. 90% of your money, choose a good fund and invest there. 10% uh, of your money, do it and learn from it. See, and if you, you know, if suddenly it multiplies five times, go and have a party. Uh, and uh, uh, try, <coughs> use these investments as the opportunity to learn that how it works, why it works. What is the psychology? Uh, because, you know, crypto is all about psychology. People are buying because it's going up and more people buying even more. And there are a lot of people who, who have not bought. They think that they have missed the opportunity, so they have to fall in line. So, it, you know, it will make a comeback again. Uh, these are cyclical things. There will be rage. There, there will be revival. Uh, but you have to really understand that, uh, you know, taking lessons, learning from it, having a plan, and 90% of your plan should be something which uh, will not devastate you. It will eventually work out because that is my sense, your methodical plan of investment in equity. Because equity, why they go up over a period of time simply because you know it's a general bet on economy. If five years from now, we will be better off, many companies will grow and prosper. When these companies will grow and prosper, whether they grow at 10%, whether they grow at 20%, uh, whether they grow, grow at 40%, they will grow. If they will be bigger, better business, uh, you will benefit. And uh, your benefit will be very much, you know, if you make anything more than what you earn in a deposit uh, from a bank, in a bank, uh, you have won. If you may make little more than what the inflation rate is, you are able to, you know, much more than protect the worth of your capital. If you just keep it in your locker, it is losing its value. So have that as a reference point be a long-term investor and most investors with that orientation end up making some serious money. And a small part of your money have your fund allocation. Maybe if you have a large amount of money, maybe have your fund allocation of a fixed amount. 5 lakh rupees is my fund allocation, 50,000 rupees is my fund allocation. Whatever, whatever you choose to, whatever you are comfortable with. The allocation, the fund allocation should be an amount that if it becomes zero, you will not cry. And uh, if it becomes two, uh, you know, five times, you'll feel happy. Uh, but the rest of your money should be invested in such a manner that your overall financial uh, well-being is not, uh, you know, uh, is not at stake. Okay, so um, let me just go through some of the questions. Michelle Morris, thank you for the 400 rupees contribution. It helps us pay salaries, buy equipment and continue to do this work. Remember, we're independently funded. We don't run any advertisements. So uh, it's really with your help that we're able to do this. Sheful Rahman says crypto is also about timing. You see a tweet by Elon Musk, you buy that crypto. Here's the problem, really. If I were to come to you, Sheful, Sheful, and if I said, listen, can you give me some money? I'm going to start a company and do a business. You'll ask me 10 questions. What is the business? How will you make money? What will your margin be? How many people will work for you? That sort of thing, right? That's the fundamentals of the business that I will start. Nobody's figured out the fundamentals of crypto yet. We don't, I mean, other than the fact that everybody's buying and Elon Musk is buying and so you're also buying, it's not, you know, the fundamentals are not really clear and that's what the Nukmar is talking about. And so he said very clearly that the money that you want to save, you want it to grow, you want it to do well for you, 
put it in a stable investment that you've done your research on and the extra money and we've seen those ads in the middle of our cricket matches that say you can put as little as 100 rupees in cryptocurrency put 100 rupees and if 100 rupees becomes zero then you maybe won't feel so bad uh, okay then- um, fay uh, fay i just want to you know uh, while you were talking i was i just you know googled elon musk net worth <laughs> and his net worth is 24420 crore and if he if he loses you know 20 50 crore in a day it won't matter to him it will it will be very meaningful amount for you so that is what i'm saying elon musk money the scale of elon musk money <laughs> in crypto you should be putting your money of that scale that if you lose it you don't mind and if you make it you will have fun uh and you decide your, uh, you know, your fun allocation. Elon Musk is having fun. Elon Musk is having fun. And if you if you consider, you know, pass the parcel, the music is stopping and analogy. Elon Musk is going to give it, give the parcel to you before the music stops. Yes, and that's yes, how yes. he's going to make money. Yes. He will wind up with more money and you will wind up with less money. But I do want to ask you this. A lot of young people turn around when you tell them not to take crypto seriously. Just consider you old fashioned. What's your response to that? Uh, you know, I really, uh, um, sometimes I have written column for the newspapers and people, not, they don't really say you are old fashioned. Uh, uh, they say that, you know, you're an idiot. Uh, you don't understand. Things. And, uh, so, so, you know, that, that's one thing, uh, they, they, they really consider you insane and uh, rightly so, because, you know, their own experience has been that it has given them great fun. They have, you know, they, they invested some money and they actually multiplied it many times. And uh, without any understanding and without any effort. So, you know, uh, there isn't uh, easy money. And uh, you should really uh, you should really take note of it. Easy come, easy go. So uh, this is something. And something which is too good to be true will not be true. Uh, and this is a lesson which people should take note of forever. Uh, this is a lesson which people should uh, be very serious about. And uh, if you don't change, if you don't really ask questions, uh, also, you know, I would like to argue a bit because, you know, cryptocurrency, the building the case against it, it has gone beyond an argument because, you know, there are believers and there are disbelievers and the believers are, uh, you know, uh, too strong a believer that they are not willing to listen or, you know, it's not. But I would like to, I just have one argument uh, that, you know, no government is ever going to get, you know, government make only, you know, there is something which is unique about a government is that uh, they can print money. And they are unlikely to be de- delegating it to anybody else. And so it's not going to be a currency. Uh, yeah. uh, take note of it. You know, otherwise, you will not have government. And you know, the way crypto on a larger scale, crypto is a very dangerous thing for government. Because uh, law and order, if you look at you know, when you are buying crypto, the other end could be an anonymous you know, drug uh, dealer. Uh, or it could be uh, you know, uh, you know, money going uh, for buying uh, you know, if you, if I have to really open a bank account and to deposit ten thousand rupees, I have to go do a KYC. I have to do all kind of compliances. Government is able to keep track of it. Uh, yes, uh, it, it it is now beginning to happen. But the, the charm of the cryptocurrency is that you don't know who the buyer is, and you can actually remit any kind of money without and under the radar. So that is something which is not going to happen. And uh, if it is going to get uh, taxed as an asset, I don't know what, for any asset, there is an underlying. When I buy a mutual fund, the underlying could be bonds and you know stocks. When you buy a house, of course you buy a house. Uh, here is something which, you know, uh, you don't know what's there, the there's nothing is there. Yeah. You know, you're just owning it. And uh, not, not, it's not, a, uh, you know, guaranteed or, you know, it's simply because, you know, other yes. people are willing to pay some worth of it. <laughs> We have uh, we have a question that's been asked a couple of times. I'm going to take it. Akash Singh Bagga says, uh, have you considered using apps like Small Case where you can uh, buy and sell a portfolio based on an idea for a fee? So basically, these are apps, I'm sure you're familiar with them, mm-hmm. that design portfolios for you. Mm-hmm. It's a replacement for the physical mutual fund agent in, in my mind. Is this something you recommend? A uh, small case is very interesting. You know, it is actually somewhere in between a mutual fund and buying stocks directly. When you buy stock, you have to choose which stock to buy. Here you say that, okay, there could there are different strategies available on small case. 
by different advisors, different fund managers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you choose to invest, you know, something like 5,000 or 10,000 rupees, it will be a bunch of stock for which you place an order. And it is actually a managed portfolio. Managed and advise, It is not a managed portfolio. It is an advised portfolio. And you are investing. In, so I think it is, it is a better vehicle as compared to buying stocks directly. But if you, you know, they are not tightly regulated, it, it effectively, you know, the, the, the taxation bit of it, uh, you will be taxed as if, you know, you are buying those stocks individually. Anything which you sell will be, tree, will be taxed, you know, as short-term or long-term gains, depending on your holding period. Uh, I would say that, you know, you have these various vehicles available. You can buy a low-cost index fund. You can buy an actively managed mm-hmm. fund. You can buy, you know, you can invest in a bunch of stocks through a small case. Or you can, if you have the time and inclination, you choose your stock and invest directly. But, you know, there are other rules which one should not violate. And it is a rule which one should, you know, formulate for oneself. Investing in equity, make sure that it is the money which you are unlikely to need for a couple of years. If it is not your long-term money, you will not be able to stick around. Try and stagger your investment. <coughs> you don't know how good, you know, what, what is a good market level, what is a bad market level. So long-term money, uh, st- spread your investments over time, diversify, never compromise on this. Even if you are very convinced of few stocks that, okay, you believe in them and you can you think that, okay, they will multiply, everybody goes wrong. And uh, basically there's a possibility that you it could be wrong. So that is why diversify. Uh, I, and that diversification could be spread over, you know, five stocks, 10 stocks, depending on your comfort. The striking a balance that, you know, what you are convinced of, how much effort you are, how much, how confident are you of them? And uh, other thing is that, you know, stick through the lean times. If you don't, you will make your losses permanent. Right. So don't panic and take your money out because the stock yep. market is falling. Uh, we have Ansh Bhatia who says guilt funds right now. Yes or no. Uh, these are funds that invest effectively in government securities. Is this something you would recommend? No, not at all. And at this point, it, they're highly dangerous. Uh, you know, guild funds, you, the, when you invest in guild, they never, you know, there is absolutely no question about uh, they defaulting because uh, you are lending it to the government effectively. Uh, the real problem is that, you know, long maturity guilds or even medium maturity guilds, the interest rate is likely to go up. And if it interest rates go up, long-term bonds or any bond goes down in value. So there will be a capital loss. It, that doesn't mean that, you know, the guilt is going to default, but you will be faced with a situation that, you know, you bought something and why it happens because, you know, uh, guilt will be carrying, you know, the price of a guilt will be adjusted to the current prevailing interest rate. If interest rates go up, then the future bond issue by the government will happen at a higher interest rate, will, ha- will carry higher coupon. So the older bonds, which will be, which will be yielding lower, they simply get discounted to adjust to a price whereby they will be yielding, the current yield will be higher. So these will take a hit. And sometimes those decline, you know, and longer the maturity, steeper the fall. Mm -hmm. So one should be very, uh, one should be very of long-term bonds at this, at this point. There are also other sectoral funds that are sectoral ways to approach it. If we look at our market today, for example, the banking stocks recovered faster than everybody else. There are our IT stocks, our infrastructure stocks, telecom stocks, that sort of thing. Do you recommend at all people consider these sectors as, at a time like this? Uh, are there any sectors that you see will do really well or equity diversified is, is what you're recommending? For most investors, equity diversified takes care of it. In fact, if you take little, you know, you have this opportunity, opportunity fund, you have this uh, focused fund. They are, you know, diversified fund with a relatively narrower focus, you know, they could be overweighting some sector more than others. So that is that is that could be one way. But I think for most investors, because you know the, these sector funds, uh, in fact, they are, they look like they have a case. But you know, most investors actually got, get the wrong end of it. Investors start investing in these funds after they have gone up, simply by looking at the previous past, you know, the past performance. And we tend to forget the statutory disclaimer. And uh, uh, then, you know, and most of the time, you know, it is uh, after it has gone up and then it translates into a huge disappointment because when you look at, you know, technology fund going up by 70% last year, 
you will invest and then you will find that there's great extreme cyclicality in the performance of uh, the, these funds. They are never in the middle. They are always at the top or bottom of the pack of the chart. If you go to value research online, go to the fund section, go get at the bottom, you will see all the category returns. Uh, sector funds are always, you know, some sector will be at the top, some sector will be at the bottom. And uh, uh, so it, they're exciting. But I think, you know, choosing the boring way when it comes to core of your investment is more rewarding. That's really interesting. Also, for our audience who doesn't know, an equity diversified mutual fund is a mutual fund that invests across the market. So you're not saying, I only want large caps, or I only want small caps, or I only want infrastructure, I only want telecom. It basically <laughs> gives the fund manager the freedom to choose whatever that fund manager feels will do well. And it also allows you to be invested across the market without taking any one particular risk, because any sector you choose will have a down and will have an up. This way, your fund manager has the ability to move in and out of sectors depending on what is going on. Uh, we have a question from Himanya Baweja who says, BPCL disinvestment, your views, please. Yeah, that is going to be a huge, you know, a milestone uh, for the country. And uh, I think it will also, you know, uh, my, you know, I started value research uh, in 1991. And uh, the first thing that value research, I did at Value Research before I got into the business of tracking mutual funds was tracking public sector companies. And uh, so uh, my, uh, I have uh, a, you know, a very long-term intimate understanding of the way the disinvestment, you know, those days, 1990, 91, uh, government was finding it very difficult to sell the stocks of these companies. So it used to bundle the, uh, stock of some of these companies and used to sell it to mutual funds and there were only eight mutual fund companies then on the public sector ones. Uh, okay, uh, the big value unlocking of these, the, you know, the, many of these public sector companies are great assets. They are, you know, they are built on being a great monopoly for a long period of time. They are also very, you know, staffed by very high quality people. They also have great technology and they have some distinct competitive advantage. You know, when I look at the BPCL, uh, the kind of network that I see, the num amount with the scale of um, the refining capacity. And so, you know, it's an integrated uh, um, all uh, thing. And, you know, the, uh, the moment the ownership changes, the amount of upside, I have seen it in all the companies where a company was sold lock, stock, barrel whether it be Hindustan Zinc, whether it be Balco or, you know, many such companies, uh, the kind of unlocking that happens by, because public sector company, the biggest problem is the government itself, the owner itself. The biggest risk factor is government, which is dysfunctional, which is not conducive to running a business uh, enterprise well. And uh, so change of ownership and change of ownership by giving a, a key and complete freedom and ownership to a uh, my sense is that you know a business needs a owner, a need, business needs a malik. You know, so once he gets once it gets one, <clears throat> and they work towards maximizing, I think <clears throat> it will turn out to be a hugely rewarding opportunity for individual investors as well. Uh, we have another question here from uh, let me see from Akash Bagga who says, "What proportion do you recommend between large, mid, and small caps?" Uh, there isn't a thumb rule, but you know, if I have to devise one, uh, we we split the market in that sense. Of course, the, there is a SEBI classification which has come about, and SEBI says that top hundred companies are large cap. Uh, next two hundred companies, next two hundred companies by capitalization are mid cap, and the remaining, you know, about another seventeen, eighteen hundred companies are small cap. Uh, everything below, uh, uh, you know, the top three hundred companies are small cap. But I would say that, you know, this is a typical uh, structure to follow. The top 100 companies, they account for nearly, you know, 78, 80% of the market capitalization. Yes. So, uh, but at the same time, I would say that, you know, tweak it for, uh, for optimizing your return. Small cap and mid cap actually hold great promise over a long period of time, but that it should be held in such a manner that you are not driven out of it. And if you, have, if you happen to own it independently, you will be very scared because uh, imagine, you know, a small cap funds going down in value by 70% as it did in 2008 would have scared any investor out of the market forever. 
if you if you didn't have the patience or understanding or the ability to withstand that so uh, tweak it to your liking but you know broadly have substantial allocation to large cap followed by mid cap and small cap for someone who's 25 or 30 years old at this point um, ideally putting money away for the next 20 years you did say equity diversified but how do we choose those equity diversified funds is there a checklist that we can use are there funds that you can tell mm-hmm. us that we can start investing in right now yeah uh, go to value research and you know you have a lot of public information pub- yeah, and you know in this information is uh, available in the public domain for mm-hmm. most of the inform- uh, for most of the fund i i would look at you know if i have to uh, create a checklist of two three things one is that i would look for a fund which has done well over a longer you know all of full market cycle and that full market cycle will be a down cycle and a up cycle so if you are looking at five year return uh choose the fund which have done well over the last 5 years then look at the second part that it ha- it should if it has done well in both the uh, declining as well as the rising market uh and has it re- really been able to beat the you know maybe the top quartile among its category itself and these numbers are uh, you know widely available uh if you find that then just then check one qualitative thing that the fund manager has stuck around if you know all the return or all the performance was generated by a person who is no longer there uh because the fund manager is an important person and has you know uh, one can attribute a great deal of performance to that fund manager whatever you know a fund company might be claiming that it is fund company or the process and this and that uh, yes they are material but finally he takes a call and uh, he uh, uh, so he delivers so if you look at these three things you are unlikely to go wrong and also mind you uh don't procrastinate you know i think the bigger problem is that investors tend to postpone the idea of starting investment while they are trying to look for the best fund don't wait for the best fund uh even if you are and it's impossible to actually predict the one which will be the best in the course of your investment because m- most important thing is that the fund should be the best fund or among the best funds after you have invested so that you benefit from it not the one which has done uh, which have, you know which has been the best so uh, get started and uh, you know once your scale goes up look for more than one fund so does the star rating make a difference we know that on value mm. research you give star ratings up to 5 stars yeah so should we look uh, at a five star fund i would like to you know say that uh, start with your five star and four star fund that should be the starting point for you know because there you will come across too many funds in a in a category so that will help you narrow your selection uh, or rather you know i would urge you to you know start your selection with a broader selection by dropping one star and two star fund and uh, then look at you know these variables because star rating can also be sometimes misleading in a sense that uh, star rating do not take into account the fund manager's continuity Consist- it it does take into account the consistency of performance the risk adjusted performance of the fund so yes a uh, star rating do reflect that uh, you know if a fund if two funds are alike in terms of return both funds went up by 100% in the last 5 years but one one fund went up and down very rapidly the other fund actually did it with great stability that fund which uh, achieved that return with great stability might be a five star fund the other fund might turn out to be a two star fund so uh, we have we are biased for greater stability and uh, performance so that is the only thing that uh, that goes into that rating nothing qualitative so yes starting with your your fund uh, selection in the five star four star universe or dropping the one star and two star ones is a good starting point all right uh, we've run out of time here but uh, we will try and answer more questions and ask uh, the ring coach to come back and spend more time uh, with us but uh, it is it is an interesting time um, to be an investor mm-hmm. because of where we are as a country and uh, where we're going as a country and to start off with any amount of money that you can spare um, you know mutual funds allow you to start really small you can do an sip of 500 rupees a month so uh, instead of buying that expensive cup of coffee start your sips right now you build confidence over a period of time you can keep increasing the money you're putting aside trust me when i say you will not be sorry all right uh, dinesh kumar thank you so much for spending time with thank us thank you answering our questions thank you right?
Thank you. Such a pleasure, as always, to chat with you. Uh, Thank for, you. For our audience, write to me. For, leave it in the in the comment section if you have more questions, and we'll try and do this more often so that we can be of a larger help to you. Thank you so much for watching. The news is up with Amita at exactly nine o'clock. Thank you for watching. Good night.